Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me at the back? How are you this morning? No, that's too, too. How are you? Are you enthusiastic? Yes. Can I tell you why I want you to be? But let me first say good morning to you. Huimora. Dima Chaloni. Where are the vendor speakers? Let's give them a hand. And where are the Tonga speakers? Who are the Tonga speakers? Yes, let's give them a hand as well. They are our two small, smallest linguistic groups, and I'll come back to that point in a moment because of the importance of understanding that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to say just a few things to you. The first thing I want to say is that it's really interesting to be a lawyer in South Africa and particularly interesting to be a lawyer in South Africa now. So I want you to be interested. I want you to be enthusiastic. The second thing I want to say to you is that the law repays hard work. Can you hear me right back there? Are you, are you okay there? Do you want me to change to Tonga? <laughs> That's good. You must always call a lawyer's bluff. <laughs> Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, the second thing is that the law repays hard work. One of my mentors used to say to me, you're not entitled to express an opinion on the issue until you know what the cases say. So there's a lot of hard work with law. You're going to have to read a lot of cases, a lot of our cases. People tell me our judgments are too long. I agree. But it repays hard work. So read the cases, read the materials that your tutors and your lecturers give you because when you read them, you are better informed. And when you're better informed, you become a better lawyer. Some people say, well, you know, that issue about uh, the scorpions or the hawks, anyone can decide it. It's not true. The law is an intricate mechanism. Our legal system goes back several thousand years to Roman, Roman Dutch law, the transitional law, and our constitution. There's a lot at stake. And the third thing I want to tell you is that very point, that we have a fight on our hands. A fight on our hands that we cannot take for granted. We've had a legal system, a constitution, a constitutional democracy for 21 years, and it's worth fighting for. And my third message to you is that you as young lawyers have a particular responsibility at this time in our democracy to fight for democracy, to fight for independent institutions, to fight for the rule of law, and to fight for social justice. Because without social justice, we won't have a legal system. That's my whole message, ladies and gentlemen. Now you can go to lunch. <laughs> Shall I repeat it all? Yes. Okay, I want to repeat it all because it's important, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start with why it's so interesting to be a lawyer in South Africa. And the reason is that the centerpiece of our democracy is the constitution and the rule of law. And to understand why that is, we have to go back to our history and to go back to apartheid. And what was unique about apartheid is that it was enforced through the law. It was a minutely legally regulated system where people like me and Zeiss van Seyl said to people like you that you cannot be equal under the law because of the color of your skin. It was a shameful thing, ladies and gentlemen. And its main feature was that it used the law. Legal statutes, legal regulations, proclamations, it was minutely detailed. But the paradox was that if you try to enforce any system through the law, the law must have authority. The law isn't brute force. Brute force is simply the police and the dictator's thugs enforcing the will with, with truncheons and with machine guns. If you've got a system of law and you want the law to have authority, there's got to be some justice. And that some justice is what a whole generation of public interest lawyers fought for under apartheid. Starting with Mr. Nelson Mandela, who was a young attorney in his 30s, 
when the Defiance campaign started in 1950. And he used the legal system. He believed in the legal system. It was unjust and oppressive. It was racist. But he knew that the law should be for something else. The law should not be to take away people's dignity, to tell them that they're inferior. The law should be to say, you as an individual, your beauty and your dignity can flourish under the legal system, under equality, under dignity, under values, under aspirations, and with social rights. He knew that and he saw that. And so we had a very big fight under apartheid, a fight for justice, which mostly lost, but which won often enough so that at the end of apartheid, people knew that we could use the legal system, unjust as it was, we could use that legal system as the basis for creating our future. And where I work now in Constitution Hill, how many of you have been to Constitution Hill? Put up your hands. That's, that's very nice. But I want you all to come. You must all make a point of coming to Constitution Hill. It's well worth a visit. In our courtroom, we've taken the bricks from the prison where black people, mostly black men, were imprisoned. You had to have a pass. If you didn't have a pass, you got arrested and put into a police van. And you were taken to number four, right there in Bromfontein on Constitution Hill, next to the fort and the women's jail. And hundreds of thousands, probably millions, of mostly black men who were pass offenders passed through that prison. And the bricks from that prison are the foundations and the walls of our court in the Constitution. So our Constitution is rooted in the past. It's not a Constitution that says we are all equal. Because our past has made us unequal on grounds of gender, on grounds of race, on grounds of culture, on grounds of sexual orientation. Sexual orientation. I mentioned the word. Can I have a brief digression, ladies and gentlemen? I'm a gay man. And I'm a proudly gay man. Why am I proud to be gay? For the same reason that I'm proud to be white. Why am I proud to be white? Because it's the way I am. I don't have a choice about it. It's the way I was born. It's beautiful to be white. It's not better than black. It's the way I am. It's the same with being gay or lesbian. If you're straight, if you're heterosexual, opposite sex oriented, it's the way you are. You were born that way. There's nothing you can do about it. Some of you are mixed up, bisexual, across a spectrum of sexuality. But sexual orientation and gender diversity and gender sensitivity are important on the UJ campus. They're important in the law school. And I make that diversionary point right away. I mentioned that I'm a gay man because all of you, every single one of you, where are the vendor speakers? Put up your hands again. You've all got lesbian and gay relatives, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you just don't know it. <laughs> if you've got 10, how many of you have got 10 or more relatives? Put up your hands if you've got 10 or more cousins, brothers and sisters. All of you, you've all got gay and lesbian relatives. <laughs> because one in 10 of humanity is either same-sex oriented, one in 20 is exclusively same-sex oriented, like me, and another one in 20 is along that spectrum of bisexuality, of same-sex interest, leaning heterosexual, leaning homosexual. So 10% of humanity is gender diverse, ladies and gentlemen. Get used to it. It's as Archbishop Tutu says, we've got famines, we've got wars, we've got corruption, we've got misgovernance, we've got terrorism, we've got religious extremism on the African continent. We don't need to worry about sexual orientation. Do you agree, ladies and gentlemen? Anyone who doesn't agree, <laughs> you're welcome to come up. But ladies and gentlemen, it's an important issue about gender diversity as well, about femininity. Do you feel safe on this campus, ma'am? You must feel safe and you must feel respected by every single man. Because your gender is important and your gender as a woman is important and precious to us. So we must cultivate that sense of respect inside the law school. So ladies and gentlemen, we fought for a constitution that came into effect 21 years ago. A constitution that's built 
on respect for diversity. Diversity which apartheid rejected and had contempt for. Apartheid prized whiteness and maleness and heterosexuality. And in the Constitution, we said we're turning our backs on that. And it was the right thing to do. Because as we were becoming a democracy in April 1994, we saw evidence of what happens when you don't value and embrace and celebrate diversity. And we saw that evidence at the very same time as we were having our national elections in April 1994. We saw it in Rwanda. In Rwanda, in three months, 900,000 Tutsis were massacred. Is there anyone here from Rwanda or Burundi? 10,000 people a day, every day for 90 days, ladies and gentlemen. So our continent has a terrible history of disrespecting diversity. And the reason why I singled out the Venda speakers and the Tonga speakers is that our constitution recognizes their languages, even though they're both groups of only about a million people. Afrikaans speakers, first language speakers, what, six or seven million? Zulu speakers, 70 million. No, sorry, seven million. <laughs> Who are the Zulu speakers? Do you admit that you promote your language? Rightly so, it's a beautiful language. But they're all equal. The language of commerce, the language of communication in the courts, the language of business, in our court as well as mainly English. But we do have litigants who come to us in Afrikaans or Tosa. You're entitled to do so. Because the very premise of the Constitution is not just that we tolerate diversity and difference, but that we actually draw our strength from it. And that you as young lawyers are sent into the world to, re to respect and to promote and to fulfill. So ladies and gentlemen, the other principles of the Constitution which are primary, those which our court has set to God, are the separation of powers. Mr. Van Sale, when he talked this morning, he and his colleagues, are an independent institution guaranteed by the Constitution. The National Prosecuting Authority has constitutional independence to decide who should be prosecuted. And it's unlawful to interfere with their decisions. We're having a crisis of independence right now, ladies and gentlemen. And that comes back to my third point, which is the fight that you're all involved in. We've got a fight on our hands. We cannot simply assume that legal values, social justice, aspirations towards equality and dignity, we cannot assume that the rule of law is going to triumph because they're powerful forces that are opposed to it. They are powerful forces that don't like independent institutions. It's not unique to South Africa, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not making a political statement about President Zuma or Mr. Malema or anyone else. In any democracy where you have power, you have to have separation of powers. You have to have a judiciary, a legislature, and an executive. And you have to have them balancing each other. And the most important component of the separation of powers is the judiciary. And without strong-minded, capable, hard-working lawyers, the judiciary cannot work. So the task upon your shoulders is very big. We've still got a long way to go in our country, ladies and gentlemen. Our constitution is young, but it's the world's most progressive. It's the world's most open-hearted, big-spirited constitution. And we have to make it work. One of the ways that we've got to make it work is through social justice. Some of you hope to become wealthy lawyers. Who hopes to become a wealthy lawyer? Put up your hands. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Can I tell you this, ladies and gentlemen? Let me tell you something which I want to, I want to tell you very carefully. There's nothing wrong in wanting 
prosperity in your own lives on condition that you work for it. That's why corruption is so bad, because corruption is wealth stolen from the public without any work being done. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do well and to succeed and to prosper provided you work for it. But hear me on this. If you want to be a lawyer in South Africa, you're going to have to ensure that the legal system continues to function. And for the legal system to continue to function and to play the course it does in our country, it's got to be a just legal system. It's the same dilemma as the apartheid force uh, uh, regime had. They couldn't enforce apartheid through the law unless they allowed the judges to give some decisions which were anti-apartheid. They couldn't perpetuate apartheid unless they allowed the trade unions in the 1980s. The trade unions adopted the law and fought for their rights through the law, through the apartheid legal system. And the same principle applies now. We cannot be lawyers. We cannot be lawyers and judges, let alone prosperous lawyers and judges, unless we extend the benefit of our country's prosperity to everyone. The fundamental principles on which our Constitution is based are the supremacy of the Constitution, It's the primary source of all values in our legal system. It's higher than the president, higher than the judiciary, higher than parliament, higher than the administration. Secondly, the separation of powers, which is a balance of power between the arms of government, with the judiciary having responsibility in the end to pronounce on the legality of it. And the third principle is this idea of social justice, because the people who made our constitution, the first constitutional assembly, which we voted for, those of us who could vote in 1994, they understood something very important. It's all very well to say that everyone has freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of conscience and freedom of movement and freedom of association and freedom of expression. But all of those beautiful rights mean nothing if you're hungry. Am I right? Some of you come from homes where I think people are still hungry. Am I right, ladies and gentlemen? So we have to ensure through our commitment to the law that the Constitution's commitment to social justice and equality becomes a real one. Once we are on the road to social justice and equality for everyone, for the poorest of the poor. Because the legal system is designed to protect the poorest of the poor. Once we're on that path, then you can relax and say, I'm entitled to my prosperity. And that's why I say, don't feel bad about it. But remember that as lawyers, your commitment to social justice is indispensable. It's not just a matter of conscience or a matter of morality. It's a matter of practical self-survival. You will not survive as lawyers if our legal system goes the way of other legal systems like in Swaziland or Zimbabwe. I know there's some people from Zimbabwe here. Where are the people from Zimbabwe? Someone who accompanied me. Yes, don't be shy. Who's from Zimbabwe? Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about Zimbabwe. It's a country that shows spectacularly how the rule of law has not been implemented, how autocracy and dictatorship have triumphed over the rule of law. And the same happens in Swaziland, where King Mswati is an autocrat, a hereditary autocrat. Where are the Swati speakers? Don't be shy. Are you from Swaziland? I'm not going to ask you to say anything about King Mswati. You may be silent. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. When you speak about King Mswati and about President Robert Mugabe, during the election, Mr. Julius Malema, the head of the EFF, was reported to have told a meeting in Polokwane that President Jacob Zuma was fortunate that he wasn't sitting on a street corner selling single cigarettes for a living 
because that's what he should be doing. <laughs> Don't be shy to laugh. <laughs> can I tell you why you can laugh, ladies and gentlemen? Because it's outrageous. It's outrageous that anyone can say of the president of a country that he should be sitting on a street corner, that he deserves to be selling <laughs> single cigarettes. But let me tell you why I was so proud to hear it. I heard it late night on the radio, on the 10 o'clock 702 news. It was the last item. Across two-thirds of the land mass of the planet Earth, Mr. Julius Malema would have been locked up the next morning in Swaziland, in Zimbabwe, in Botswana. President Ian Kama doesn't like criticism. Throughout the rest of Africa, through Russia, China, the Caucasus, parts of South America, two-thirds of our planet, he would have been locked up. Here, no one even noticed it. I'm proud to live in a democracy under a constitution where Mr. Malema is free to say outrageous things about President Zuma. <laughs> but the point is a profound one, ladies and gentlemen. It's one that you've got to fight for. You've got to fight for the system of authority that confers on President Zuma the power to exercise executive authority in order to make our constitution real and just. But you've also got to fight for the right of citizens who disagree with him to be able to criticize him frontally. And to President Zuma's credit and the ANC's credit, there was no follow-up. I didn't read about it anywhere. Mr. Malema is free to make those statements and he's free to speak out his mind and no one laid a charge against him, no one sought to change the law or to prosecute him. That is something worth fighting for, ladies and gentlemen. But the most important thing is that our constitution sees that equality has to be real. And you are the agents of constitutional supremacy, you are the agents of separation of powers, you are the agents of social justice, you are the agents of constitutional equality. I can't even laugh, you don't have to be able to do it anymore. Was it a good grapje? No, you can. I keer it good. I have also laughed in my first year. And there's a lot to enjoy and to delight in the law, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you a bit about social and economic rights and this is the last part of what I want to say. It's going to take about another five or ten minutes but I want to draw together what I've been saying to, to you by mentioning one of the rights to social and economic justice and it's the right to health care and it's one of the rights which our constitution embodies which makes it different from the constitution of Canada, the constitution of Australia, the European Charter Convention on Human Rights, the Constitution of the United States of America. We have a constitution which, as I've explained, is based on the principle of the empty stomach. That the law has to cater for the empty stomach as well as for the first order rights. And that's why we have the right of access to housing, the right of access to health care, the right to education, the right to social security, the right of access to food. And the one I want to use to close off the last part of my talk is the right to health care. Because just as we were becoming a democracy, just as Rwanda was experiencing the horrific, experiencing the horrific genocide of 1994, the AIDS epidemic was flooding into South Africa. 1990, national prevalence of below 2%. 1995, a national prevalence of 5% as President Mandela took office. And I mention this because 21 years later, we have what the epidemiologists call a mature epidemic. And a mature epidemic means that almost everyone here knows someone who has died of AIDS. Am I right? Put up your hands if you've got a family member or a member of the community who's died of AIDS. Don't be shy, ladies and gentlemen. We all have it. We have lost well over a million or maybe two million people in our country to the AIDS epidemic. 
And what happened in 1994 is that there was an intersection of this new promising aspirational legal system and the dreadfulness of the AIDS epidemic. And in a completely unexpected way, the rule of law and the courts and lawyers played a pivotal part in our national response to AIDS. Because when President Mandela left office in 1999, his successor, President Mbeki, had very, very, very alarming views on the causes and treatment of AIDS. He appeared to be sympathetic to a tiny fraction of loonies who queried whether HIV is the cause of AIDS, whether you can test for HIV, whether you can treat AIDS. And the reason for his doing that was stigma. This disease is the most stigmatized disease in human history. It's stigmatized, ladies and gentlemen, even though it is now medically manageable. I know that because after I came out as a gay man in the 1980s, I became infected with HIV. And I'm living with HIV. And in 1997, I was very, very, very sick with AIDS. And I was going to die. But I was very lucky. I started on antiretroviral therapy in November 1997. It'll be 18 years at the end of this year. And I take three tablets once every morning, and they keep me very, very fit and healthy, and I'm very grateful for that, ladies and gentlemen. I wake up every morning thinking, what an extraordinary thing it is to be a conscious human being. It is wonderful, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? But there was a terrible struggle. I started the drugs at a time when I was still too scared to talk about my own HIV. But when I recovered and after a woman in Umlazi township called Gugudlamini died, I determined to speak out about discrimination and stigma and about treatment. But at the very same time, President Mbeki was saying no. We're not going to offer treatment. It's toxic. We don't know if it helps. We don't know what the causes of AIDS are. We need further study. We need further investigation. I didn't need further investigation, ladies and gentlemen. I was going to be dead. The mean survival time for a 41-year-old man with the full symptoms of AIDS as I had, with medical care and a home as I had and a good job as I had, the mean survival time is 30 months, two and a half years. I should have been dead in June 2000. Well, it's nearly 15 years later. I didn't need further study, ladies and gentlemen. And the treatment action campaign was organized and started to tackle the question of drug prices. And they won that battle. Young people like yourselves from the townships and the rural areas of our country, they took on the international pharmaceutical companies and they won. Minister Mutswaledi has just negotiated the next tranche of antiretroviral treatment provision for less than 100 rand per person per month. And let us all give thanks, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a person of integrity and ability and focus and idealism in the, in the cabinet. Minister Mutswaledi, raise your hands to him, ladies and gentlemen, please. We should be grateful. But, 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 President Mbeki refused. Powerful man, a proud man, a man who wanted to rescue our continent from centuries of degradation, from racism and colonialism, a man who wanted to restore the humanity of Africa, the African Renaissance, the dignity of blackness. He made a terrible mistake about HIV. But the Treatment Action Campaign used all its constitutional rights. None of them was over 35, ladies and gentlemen. Zaki Ahmed, all of the leaders were young people like yourselves. Young, determined, angry, idealistic, smart people who knew that they had a constitution. They had the right to assemble. They had the right to march, and they marched 
on the union buildings, on Tainhuis, on Parliament. They marched on the drug companies. They marched in Nelspruit and they marched in Durban in every provincial capital. But they had the strongest right of all, which was Section 27.1, which gives everyone the right of access to health care. And Section 27.2, which says that government must take reasonable measures, legislative and other measures, to ensure the right of access to health care. And they said that President Mbeki was not being reasonable. And you had a judge in Pretoria who looked at all the evidence. And he could judge dispassionately between the Minister of Health, President Mbeki on the one side, and the Treatment Action Campaign, and Kasatu, and the South African Council of Churches, and all the organizations, the Pediatric Medical Association that brought the application. And he found for the applicants. And President Mbeki took the case on appeal to the Constitutional Court before I got there. But I was watching because I knew that these drugs were giving me life every day. And 500,000 people every year were dying of AIDS by the time President Mbeki took office in 1999. And the court ruled. The court looked at all the evidence and it ruled unanimously that President Mbeki's program on AIDS was not reasonable. It gave an order that he had to start making antiretroviral treatment available. And the result was that a little while later, it took some time because the TAC, is, court orders don't just happen, ladies and gentlemen, they need activists to enforce them. Good lawyers, good activists, and honest politicians. They also need courageous judges to give the order. Two and a half years after the TAC judgment, we got a national treatment program, ladies and gentlemen, and now we have the biggest antiretroviral treatment program anywhere in the world. Nearly three million people like myself are receiving ARVs from the public sector. And to go back to the Zimbabwe and Swaziland issue and the Rwandan issue, I'm very proud that when you go to a clinic and ask to be tested, and when you ask for antiretrovirals as a clinic, they don't ask for your passport, they don't ask for your papers, they don't ask for your permanent residence, they sign you up. I'm so proud of that, ladies and gentlemen, because it recognizes our humanity and it recognizes the proper principles of public health. But none of that, none of that, ladies and gentlemen, would we have had if we didn't have principled activists. Principled activists who used the law. Principled activists who formulated a good case with good evidence and good strategies and took it before the courts. And the courts were independent. And the courts respected President Mbeki like I respect President Zuma. But my duty to the law comes before any respect I have for the president of this country because that president, he or she, is subordinate to the law. And the judges gave an order. And to President Mbeki's credit, he bowed his head before the rule of law. And the history books will credit President Mbeki for that. Unlike King Mswati, unlike President Mugabe, President Mbeki bowed his head. And that case, the Treatment Action Campaign case, which you will read, is the most dramatic case that established the supremacy of the Constitution, the primacy of the law, the exigibility of social and economic rights, and the independence of the judiciary. But it could not have done that, ladies and gentlemen, and this is my final point, without you. You are young. You are committed to the law. You are interested. We live in a time of poverty, of xenophobia, of differences, of racial tensions. But we have a system of values which over the past 21 years we have made to work. Lawyers, young people like yourselves, and activists have shown that the Constitution works. We have values and norms and principles in the Constitution that show us the way forward through all our problems. But it's up to you, with all your commitment and idealism and all your truthfulness,
and all your desire for prosperity and all your wish for a just and dignified South Africa. It's up to you to make it work. Thank you very much.